What's up, everybody? You're listening to SuperiorFandom.com. This is episode 5 of the No Recess Podcast. I'm Joe Holton, as always. I'm here with my buddies Matt Long and Chris Vernick. Matt, how are you, bud? Very good. Geek to be here, my man. Chris, what's up, dude? I am just watching the NIT right now. You're watching the NIT. You uh, don't want to watch Kentucky? You go 37-0? and 0? I'm just joking with you, no. <laughs> I'm watching Kentucky. Who's... Who's playing in the NIT right now? Um, something with a bunch of directionals, and tech schools, that kind of thing, I'm guessing. <laughs> okay. is, is Stanford still in there? They, they were going deep, but I don't know, you know. I think they lost spring, last right? night or something, oh, or maybe know. not, I don't know. Chris, what happened? They're on spring break, I don't know. Oh, Stanford takes spring break? I didn't know you could take spring break and still be that smart. <laughs> yeah, it's one full day. Son of a bitch. <laughs> they probably have to go to their internship still, though, I'd imagine, right? Oh, in the morning, yeah. That goes without saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Oh, shit, man. So it was an exciting week in Giants camp. The team is playing a little better. I've actually got uh, the MLB game day updates going on right now as the Giants are playing the A's in spring training. Uh, Timmy Jim is on the mound. I expect a good year out of that guy. But um, moreover than talking about the season... There was some news, and Matt, I really needed to get your opinion on this, but uh, the Giants were valued by Forbes magazine at $2 billion, and not only is that just an astonishing number to me, but they're the only team in sports history, except for the 2012 Dallas Cowboys, that increased the value of their, of their franchise by more than a $1 billion in a calendar year. Now, keep in mind, that's without a TV deal, that's without a new stadium. They're simply doing it by winning, and they're not even really spending money on big-name free agents like the Dodgers, the Yankees, the Red Sox, etc. So they're making a ton of cash in the process. And uh, I, I don't know, I just want I, I feel like it's a, it's a uh, well, how, how should we say? It's a, it's a way of doing business. It's a business model that should be adopted by a lot of franchises across all of sports. Um, and Matt, I just kind of want to get your take on uh, the latest news. Yeah, that is a lot of money. I, I mean, I remember when one billion, which really wasn't even that long ago, was just like out of this world when franchises started to go for that. But um, it's crazy, and and I think it is a very successful business model, especially if you're sitting on the side of the CEO or you're heavy into the business corporate side of this equation i probably though come more from the uh the underground and the people yelling in the streets so even though i do find that a a cool part of the whole aspect you know i still think it makes me think i wish they would spend a little more instead of you know and and i'm not saying they haven't spent and i don't want to just go right into it because you might have a couple other takes there but I guess I kind of see this as, hey, it's great that they're making the money, but like I was reading on Twitter, this, this guy was saying, either do a better job of drafting a left fielder or open the wallet. And <laughs> that would be an example. If you, when's the, I mean, how long have the Giants not had a, had a left fielder? And I know they've won, and it's great, but let's not say that's by you know, design. Chris, I'll get to your opinion on this because I'm sure the Giants valuing it $2 billion is a really hot-button topic with you, and I'm sure you've got some really uh, awesome takes on this and, and want to get into the debate that, that me and Matt are, are still constantly bitching after winning uh, three and five years. But, Matt, I, I want to just ask you, I mean, other than, other than the, the principal reason of, you know, they just haven't had one, um, but like, wh- why do you feel it necessary that the Giants spend more money? I look at teams that, that do this, like the Dodgers and, the, and you know, the Yankees, for example, um, th- that do this. And a lot of the times, they end up spending more money trying to get guys not to play for them. Um, and and the, the Giants really haven't done that. I mean, sure, there's been a couple... Uh, bad contracts in there. You could say Zito. Um, you know, obviously Marco Scudero didn't pan out the way we'd like. Uh, Aubrey Huff, the the re up that he got was was certainly um, you know not 
you know, what any Giants fan would hope or the front office. But, um, I mean, when you, when you take those uh, questions into consideration and uh, look at where the Giants are and what they've been able to do over a consistent basis and the options that they leave themselves, when, when they do need to add a piece, they do go out and get guys like Carl. Carlos Beltran, um, and, and even Hunter Pence, really. Um, I, I just, I, I guess my question is, wh- why, why would you want them to spend more money when, when it's more often than not, it's not going to work out better than what they're already doing? Well, I would say I would first ask not to be put in a box in a black or white uh, showdown where the only response to that is that oh you just want to spend a lot of money and possibly not get good deals out of it if that was my only choice then I would say no I don't want to do that either I would say no for sure the basis of what they do is incredible I wouldn't change it very much at all I mean I like I, the idea of of at least having the ability to go there for that cash every once in a while use it very selectively like America's military should be used. Rarely use it, but I, I don't think you're telling me, or maybe you are, that the fact that they might be able to pull that bullet out every once in a while shouldn't blow up the whole philosophy of how they do business. I mean, I think they have a little more self-control than that. And I would just say, add that to your arsenal every now and then. Do everything the same. But in the case of, may, just say left field for the heck of it, you know, maybe go ahead and break that mold every once in a while if you really feel there's a player that you could go get. And not just the player that we usually throw out there, because let's face it, when we're Giants fans, we throw a certain type of player out there. I'm saying include everybody and everyone all the time for these very rare moves that you might make. Sure, and, and I actually agree with what you're saying in, in uh, you know what I mean, in, in principle there. Um, I, I, and I, I think the Giants do that. What my, like, for, and I'll, I'll go back to it. I mean, the, the 2011 year, people forget about that because the team fell short of where they were trying to get. But, but they went out on the deadline and got Carlos Beltran and gave up a really frontline prospect in, in Zach Wheeler and Tommy Joseph, who was playing with USA Baseball at the time, uh, you know, in the process of that. So I, it's not, I mean, I guess what I would say to that is just like, I think they, I think they do do the things that, that you want to have happen. I think the issue is, they're just very leery of of who they give their money to. And like the the prime example of how you don't want to be and what I think the Giants have done a great job in not doing is becoming the Philadelphia Phillies. Like that team is a total shit show and they're they're completely overspent and there's really no way to get out of it and and their farm system is shot and, and they have no options because they blew their wad early and, and I I think and it's not necessarily a bad thing when you've got you know Plan Bs out there to just fold your hand and wait for the next top notch guy. Well, okay, that's all fine and good. We're just gonna have to agree to disagree there because. I do agree that they do do that to an extent, but we're talking about to the extent of how I think they should do it. But also, I, I don't really understand the elation of some fans, which is really funny, to like be happy that you know the investors are, are getting all fat and you know the brass is making a lot of money, yet a lot of other prices get jacked up and stuff. And this isn't. This isn't a talk about, oh, let's take the ticket prices down, although that could be legitimate. I'm saying with all that going on, don't be so hesitant to make a deal. And I would just say this, I'll throw this out for instance, and I'm sure we can find poke a lot of holes in it, but let's just use it as an example. Say Cespedes. If we weren't worried about anything about money right now, and I, can, I know your mind's already turning to try to find a defense system here, 
as a lot of Giants fans do. But would would it be good if we possibly had Cespedes on the roster right now? Sure. Like- okay, 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 okay. So what I would say is I would at least carry that bullet with me a little more strongly than I think you're saying. And I know we're saying the same thing in the end. It's just of degree. And... Um, but I respect where you're saying. I see where you're coming from. I, I come from the elk that unless you know somebody, like, unless you're certain that somebody's going to be worth an $80 million investment, you should probably hold on to your money. And Chris, as, as a fan of a small market team, I just, I wonder what you think in terms of the Giants and the way that they spend their money in this evaluation. Well, <laughs> The Giants are, in many ways, very similar to the Twins. I mean, what the Giants have done in the last five years is sort of what the Twins came fairly close to doing maybe, you know, five or ten years ago when they were winning all those divisions. The Giants were just had the the pitching depth to, to actually get them to those rings. But, I mean, in terms of how the teams operate philosophically, they're, they're very similar. I mean, Sabian and... Uh, Terry Ryan are probably like two peas in a pod. And even from an ownership standpoint, uh, the poll ads have always been pretty maligned in the Twin Cities. Uh, going back to Carl, their dad, who passed away, and now it's three brothers who own the team. But it's very much what what you're saying, Joe. It's the the idea of even opening up the possibility of spending hundreds of millions of dollars on a guy, it, it doesn't even enter into their, their mindset with the exception of Joe Maurer, who I think, you know, back when he was coming off that MVP a handful of years ago and he, they, they were kind of, they didn't really have a choice, but to sign him, especially being the hometown guy, there was no way they weren't going to, to give him his money. But the idea is that you're going to develop your players. You're going to scout uh, acquisitions that you want, you're going to make you know impact signings. But you know, on the other hand, I sort of Matt, I, I totally get where you're coming from. It's like you're you're not even suggesting that they go out and be the Dodgers and just spend their way and end up paying. What are the Dodgers going to be paying this year? Like fifty million dollars to players that aren't even on the roster or something like that. Exactly, not like that. I would just you know move up that list a little. And you're not even saying every off season they need to make a. It, it's just simply be open to the possibility that if there's something a target there that you have the ability to leap at it. And I think your military analogy was actually pretty damn good. I mean, I think that's exactly you leave all all options should be on the table, especially for you know a team like the Giants that clearly money's not an issue. They it, they have the hottest fan base right now. San Francisco is a huge baseball city above all else. They have probably the best stadium in the game, probably the best game day experience in the game, and uh, that kind of hits on why. Uh, they have that two billion dollar valuation, which I also was amazed by. But when you add everything up, I mean, it, it sort of does make sense a little bit. Well, that's why I would I, it would, would be hard for me to think that the Giants don't have or could have some of those options in mind if they um, were willing. You know, I don't think that the reason that none of these guys have come or that they don't pursue all of them is just because they literally do not want any players like that. Like, I'm sure there's a select few out there that the Giants and Sabian would say, if we could pay this amount of money, which is more than we usually pay, as a baseball man, as a good baseball decision, following how we do all of our other decisions, we're just ratcheting it up a little bit on this one. There would be several players like that, I believe, unless the other side of this is saying, no, actually, there's just no players like that in the whole MLB and the Giants are just making the right decision exa- every time and drawing the line exactly where it should be drawn. I mean, if that's the answer, then I can't really say anything to that. <laughs> Serendipity. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I get what you guys are trying to say, but I need to let you know, our good buddy Murphy came in. Murph, say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Mr. Murph. We had a we had a uh, surprise visitor coming onto the show completely unprompted. Yeah, 
Me and Brooke are making sweet love in the back of the room here. <laughs> Murph, you are too much. Well, he, he's got to give us a quick Red Sox take. What are we talking now. about? We want a Red Sox take. What do you got? Oh, Murph? oh, you really want a Red Sox take? Yeah, we want a Red Sox take. What do you think of Pablo Sandoval? Oh, I love the fact that I have the Panda, okay? I love that I have the Panda. He's going to play third base. He's going to play solid third base. He's going to get me probably like 20, 23, 27 home runs this year. He's going to be an RBI machine. And you know who stands behind him? The guy called Hanley Ramirez. <laughs> What's his name, Murph? He's Ramirez. Hanley Ramirez. Oh, oh man. Man, man. Man, man is going to be okay with me. Okay, you know why? Because he's going to hit like 45 home runs this year. Because he's going to smack him over the monster. <laughs> That's what he's going to do. That is that is too much. And you know the Pedroia the Destroyer? He's got his thumb and his wrist feeling okay. It's kind of like he can jerk off again, all right? So he can jerk the shit out of his fucking nozzle, and he's going to hit some line. He's a laser show. The laser show is going to return to Beantown, all right? Oh, man, that is too show. much. Oh, man. The, but, la- the laser show. I got, I got to get some tickets to the laser show. Right? Yeah, they shoot out of my ass, like, you know, come uh, April to fucking September. So, so speaking of... So speaking of the uh, uh, the laser show and just eternal optimism for maybe no good reason at all. Uh, Chris we don't got a rotation. I'm not fucking counting on the rotation for shit, dude. Not a, they're gonna burn my toast fucking seven days out of the week. <laughs> but uh, speaking of an American League team with a questionable pitching rotation and and optimism in general, I, I do want to talk about the Twins. There was a there was a Brian Dozier deal, which I am very much a fan of. And, and just like Chris, you touched on this earlier, in terms of uh, Brian Sabian and the Twins front office kind of being two peas in a pod. Um, you know, they, they really went out of their way to get him in advance and got a, a favorable economic deal for a, for a top-notch 2020 potential guy uh, in a small market. And I just kind of want to get your opinion on that. Well, I mean, they needed to pay the guy. I mean, he's the guy puts up the numbers. He's a great player, especially for the position that he plays. Uh, they had him under contract already, you know, but this gets him through the arbitration period. He's getting paid. Uh, their farm system is loaded. So if, they, if they're going to be in three or four years where they think they're going to be, uh, they should be in very good standing with him uh, when his, you know, the real contract negotiations start in a few years for the real money. And uh, it's just, it's a win-win for everybody. It's a no-brainer. I know, Matt, that you want the, uh, the Giants to go out and spend their, their $2 billion and the money that they're valued. But, but this is very reminiscent of the, uh, of the Madison Bumgarner deal, in my opinion. And um, I, oh, I don't know, yeah. do, do, you have any, do, you have any <laughs> do you have any thoughts on this? I can, I, I, Brooks getting fired up, huh? Can, yeah, no, I would say, um, no, that's a good call. Um, a very proactive uh, contract, like, like you were saying, like the Giants did with Bum. Get your sign your st- sign your studs up early and 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 treat them well, you know. And actually, That's actually, right. uh, one thing I would say there, just Joe, just to soften up what I was saying earlier, I think the Giants do a very good job of that. <laughs> you might even argue too good of a job, like with Kane. But what I'm saying is, I think they're they well, that's a little bit different because that's later in his career. But like they they've signed up younger players before their contracts and paid them well. So they're not, you know, being stingy in that area at all. Sorry, Chris. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think the, uh, the other side of the, what you risk is, remember a few years ago when Prince Fielder was still in Milwaukee? And they, they, wouldn't, they didn't do what the Twins did and give mm. him big money to get, get him through those arbit. Every single winter, they would always go to the arbitrator and just try to pay as little as they could. And look where that got him. Uh, he's got long gone out of uh, that beer smell in town. <laughs> totally, totally. And, you know, like, I, I know the Twins have lost 90-plus for, like, 
what is it, four straight years now? But, yep. but you, you just got to kind of like what's going on around that organization. And not only is it a, is it a good economic deal, but with, uh, with Paul Molitor kind of taking over and um, running the ship there, it, it's just good to promote the, the, you know, the eternal optimism. And you've got, you've got the prospects and some young pitchers that are you know, at least uh, expected to do well. So, I mean, things have to be feeling pretty good in Twinstown. And, I mean, that's... As far as like being a fan of a team that's that's you know been on a pretty severe downside the last four years, it it's kind of hard to be any more positive than you are right now at this moment. Yeah. Well, yeah. That the, the the comparison that all the the people close to the team say is like it's like about the two thousand Twins. Remember the late nineties, the Twins were terrible, like they are right now. But you could see from the groundswell of the players coming up through the system that that was going to change and it did change. You know, they won six divisions in nine years or whatever it was. And that's sort of kind of where they're at right now with all these guys breaking in. And also unlike the AL East or the NL West, which has really gone from being the worst division to to one of the best divisions, the AL Central, it's pretty wide open. I mean, there's not a lot of great baseball teams in the Central. There never is. Even the Tigers that have, spent all that money. And I think the Tigers, by the way, are going to be the next Philadelphia Phillies economically. But the the Central, it's just not as hard to turn things around as it might be in, say, for the Toronto Blue Jays in the AL East, for instance. Now, the the, the Orioles have been able to do it to a a pretty decent extent, but it's a lot more wide open and a lot more um, room to breathe in the Central for a team that's got young guys coming up. Oh, totally, and, and to that to that end, and I, I want to get to this email that you sent to me about this kick-ass Bloody Mary with a uh, with a slice of pizza in it. So you're gonna tell me all about that in uh, in a second here. But but that that was my point exactly. Like I think I think the Tigers are you know are a year or two or maybe three away from a from a complete you know disaster and financial catastrophe. And then you've got. You know, you've got Kansas City, who's in a small market that's going to constantly be in a in a state of flux, and then and then you've got uh, you know Cleveland and Chicago, who are essentially unproven. And, and to that end, before we get to this Bloody Mary, I, I got to ask you guys: like, did did you see the SI that had the Cleveland Indians uh, picked to to win the World Series this year? Chris, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know what? I sort of like the Indians to win the Central, but I'm really at, talking at a World Series level here. I'm just not quite sold on them yet, and probably part of the reason is, you know, you look at. I mean, I love their outfield, Brantley, where they got born in center, uh, Brandon Moss now in right. I love that outfield, great outfield power. Those guys can track any ball down. I look at their infield. I got some questions about their infield. Even a guy like Carlos Santana, who's uh, a really respected player, but you know the guy hit two thirty one last year, um, and that's just that's not good enough. Even Kipnis hit two forty last year. He had a good year in twenty thirteen. Kipnis then was it, a down year though, right? Like, it, well, it's it was expected that he rebounds, right? But is he guaranteed? I mean, yeah, but he. How many great years has Jason Kipnis had? To, to say, well, he's a better player than what he showed last. And I agree. I think he's better than 240. But how do we know that he's the the 310 player that he was in 2013? He might end up being a, a 260, 265 guy. Sure. In the end. I'll buy that. I'll buy and that. The, the, left, the left side of their infield, they got that Ramirez kid who they, they parked his car in the infield today. I don't know if you guys saw that. but they, No, what happened? I put it on Facebook for Superior Fandom, but he apparently he was just indiscriminately using other players' parking spaces at their spring training facility. <laughs> so, so when he came out, I uh, went in the clubhouse for a while, you know, kind of listened to tunes or whatever, kind of got ready. And when he went out to the field, there was his his car parked out at shortstop. They had gotten his keys and driven it out to shortstop to kind of show him where his where his place is. So <laughs> it was kind of funny. That's crazy, um, and to that end. <laughs> Matt, like, what, what, you know, what do we think of of Sports Illustrated predictions after we listen to uh, that Philip Rivers 2011 MVP uh, prediction that destroyed our fantasy team a couple of years back? 
it totally destroyed our fantasy team. And yeah, I, I have a bitterness towards them too. I, it's yeah, I like Cleveland also. Um, it's just it seems like that's maybe too far of a leap for them to go. You know, although they do have Kluber and also Cody Allen is a really good closer too to go along with some of that offense that Chris was talking about. Um, but uh, we'll see. I would like to see. I would like to see the the, the Twins kind of hang around, um, you know, in this into summer and then kind of see what happens. You never know. You know, that's what's great about baseball, right? Totally. And before we before we shut the door on on part one of this thing, I, I want to. Chris, you sent me an email earlier about a uh, about a Bloody Mary that they're making at uh, at uh, the Twins' new stadium at Target Field. Just like, can you elaborate for everybody? Well, well, Kent Herbeck has a restaurant at Target Field, and for anyone who doesn't know or remember Kent Herbeck, he's a, a big, huge guy. He's probably six four, probably, and he's a gregarious. He's he's like the guy that would probably go to the U of M and do beer bongs with the, the, the sophomores there. He's, he's that kind of a guy. He's also an avid outdoorsman. He has an outdoor show in on Fox sports North, but he wanted to come up with a kind of a, a idea for a drink. And he also likes to eat because he's a bigger guy. So he decided, well, why don't we mix two things that I like, which are bloody Mary's and food. And he, they decided, well, let's call it the college days, bloody Mary. And so it's garnished with a slice of pepperoni pizza. Uh, it's got a st- uh, stick on it with a sausage, <laughs> a couple different varieties of cheese, uh, and a pepper. And then there's also, a, of course, a stick of celery in the Bloody Mary. And that, that, that's all yours for $19 at Herbex at Target Field. You know, with a piece of pizza in it, that might be a good deal given these ballpark pra- Ices and uh, two billion dollar valuations, right? Hey, bre- it, breakfast of champions, and it's quite literally true in this case. No doubt, right? That's <laughs> one good thing about baseball, man. You you can go somewhere, you can spend a weekend in a city. You know, I, I remember we went out to spring training last year. My personal favorite place was Honey Bear Barbecue. I think the I think the best podcast Superior fandom probably ever did was locked up in a hotel room of the ghetto of Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, Matt, we've done some really cool baseball trips. What, what were some of your favorites, man? Yeah, and I, live from Motel Six, right? <laughs> yeah, it was awesome, wasn't it? That that was the, the little yeah little studio set up in Motel Six. Yeah, San Diego was good too, and I I would love to go down there again, especially with the club they put together, but. Man, if if I wasn't such a big Giants fan, and heck, I've almost been to more games now down in San Diego than living in L.A. than up in San Francisco. That's a that's a tough place to beat the whole scene down there, and the the weather and just uh, we should all make a trip down there. Yes, I'm down, Murph. You're you're from Boston. What is the best ballpark experience at Fenway? What is the best thing to do in Boston before or after a Red Sox game? Oh, you want to talk to me? Yeah, you. Am I live? Yeah. Uh, so you can go to, uh, you know, there's a couple of, like, nice little, uh, you know, shanty shacks that you can have a beer before the game, right? So let's say we got a 105, we got a 105 first pitch. So you show up around 11, 11.30, you go to Boston Beer Works. Boston Beer Works is an amazing place. It has probably like, I don't know, 20, 30 taps, but it's all, there's no Bud Light. There's no fucking, you know, Paps Blue Ribbon, any of that shit, right? You get some <laughs> Hapoon, you get whatever, you know what I mean? Like some indigenous fucking good beers, all right? And then if you really nice. want, you know, you can have a lobster roll, you can get some clams, you get some fried clams, you get fucking some oysters, whatever. Uh, that's what we do. Before we go to a game, we go to you go or there's actually a place that's sacrimonious to all of us. It's called the Cask and Flag. Nice. The Cask and Flag is behind the right field pole. All <laughs> right, and that is the the place. Well, you know, you go in and have a beer and a shot with the bartender. This guy named Fitzy. <laughs> <laughs> you go in and have a shot with Fitzy. You go into the <laughs> the, the, the works, but you know. The, the, this, so much has changed in the past 20 years since I've, you know, been religiously going to Fenway. I haven't been to Fenway. I swear to God, you can kick me in the nuts in about 15 years. We I, need to fix that, Murph. Wow, yeah. yeah. 
I have not been to Fenway okay. since like 19... I, I, I saw Pedro pitch in Fenway. It's the last time I've been to Fenway. Jesus. Man, 1998 that's... or some shit like that. So it's been a while. Yeah. That's cool. You got to see Pedro Pitts. Oh, pitch he pitched against the Toronto fucking Blue Ha-Ha's, the Bluebirds. <laughs> and he fucking fanned 19 of them that day. Whoa. See, I, I don't know if I've ever seen him. I don't think I have. So that's that's a nice better than him. It was amazing. Murph, no, Murph, I've been back. I've two. seen the Bruins game. I've seen the Celts game. I've seen the Pats game. But I have not ever. I haven't been back in the Fens for a good fucking game. So I'm inviting all you fucking tight-lipped cunts to come back to Beantown with me, and we'll have a good time. <laughs> Matt, before we let Murphy get out of here, what do you got for him? No, I was just going to say that by far, you were talking about chowder, I think, earlier, or clams, but Boston by far, you know, that's Out the right of my kind of, that's, chowder. That's the right kind of clam chowder, you know, not the Manhattan. We, we like the Boston. Clam has to pass out of the head, but whatever, you know, and the potato or the fucking little thyme leaf. But usually it's all about milk and cream and potatoes. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> right on. I think we're going to close the door on part one of episode five of the No Recess podcast. Chris, thanks for doing this. And uh, Just because I came over to say hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. We will catch up with you guys soon. Thanks I got again. door privileges. Check us out at <laughs> superiorfandom.com. Follow us on Twitter at Tickle Superior my balls. Fandom. We'll see you next time. Love you.